Amen. Looking for God just to move in a wonderful way tonight. Won't you pray for us? It's been a long day. As you stand with us across the building, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. And um, it's been a good day, and I'll thank the Lord for that. I pray that you've had a good day too. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 1. It is good to see our visitors tonight, every one of you. Good to have you with us tonight. Wonderful to see the choir up there singing. I love that. They put so much time and effort and practice into it. I, like, I, I, I could really listen to them when I go to sleep, be truthful with you. I, I don't ever get tired of hearing them, and I thank them for their dedication to our church and to the Lord, certainly. I'm going to do something rare for you tonight. I want to read one verse of Scripture, verse number one. He said, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Would you bow your heads with us? Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for being with us once again. God, I pray. I know it's been a long day for a lot of people today. I know it's been a long week for many families. And Lord, we've, we've seen some people um, go on to their eternal rest. And God, I pray that you continue to be with those families and Lord, we pray that you would just hide us behind the cross, God, that you would just have your way in this message, God, that you might encourage us, stir us, strengthen us, God, challenge us to live closer to the cross, and certainly we pray if there's any lost under the sound of our voice, God, that you would draw them to an order of prayer, Lord, that their names might be wrote down in the Lamb's book of life. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name, and amen. You can be seated this evening. Thank you for standing to honor the Lord. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, and he is writing unto them, and now he ends here in verse number one of chapter seven, but really he takes off in the beginning or the mid part of chapter 11, and his appeal to them is separation and a cleansing. There, there should be a difference between us and the world, or, or the redeemed and the unredeemed, the, um, those that are righteous being born by the blood of Jesus Christ, and those that were unrighteous, the darkness and light, the contrast between all of the two, in verse number seven, I want to hang my hat for a little bit tonight. And he says, having these promises, the promises that God has given us, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If God would help me to preach tonight a simple thought on taking out the trash. There ain't nothing greater in life than taking out the trash. I mean, some of you might squirm at the thought of it, but I always enjoyed it. I got to get out of the house. And more often than getting out of the house, when I grew up, we had a long driveway and my parents allowed me to. I don't know if it was smart, safe, indifferent, but I'd take a four-wheeler. Sometimes I'd take a tractor. Sometimes I'd take um, the old spare car and I'd load up all the trash and, and in, the, in the truck or car and I'd drive down to the end of the road and offload it. And I mainly like to drive a vehicle or anything with a motor. Um, so in, it ended up that I didn't care about the trash. I just wanted to drive something with an engine on it. I guess that's the motor hit inside of me, but well, time would go on and, and I would be satisfied and happy with that and, and um, that would go on. But I realized real quick in life um, that seven of us that are living in one home, um, if you didn't include someone who was always living with us, someone lived with us from the time I was 11 years old until I moved out of the house. I think uh, my parents still got someone living with them, so um, that, is, that wasn't kin or blood to us. But at that time, uh, waste inside the home began to add up quickly and it, it was a constant thing. But at a certain point, at a certain age in my life, I realized the trash always going to run on a Tuesday. So the trash has to go out before Tuesday morning. And I don't know if the guy started with us, but he was there before the daylight broke. I knew the trash guy was going to be there early. And so with that being said, I had the importance of taking it out. Cause see, you can get by a week or so of miss. You can miss the trash guy once, but heaven forbid you miss him twice. Um, you might be in trouble by the time the third week comes along and Paul is telling them very specifically in dealing with these things in our life, we need to cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And my dear friend, as we grow uh, at different times in our life, we will produce different kinds of trash in our life. That's a whole message in itself, but I promise you it's true. My little baby Corey has a different trash and her trash 
has a different smell um, than my trash smells. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The other day, I put a new bag in the trash can and it began to have such an odor and it was like 20 degrees outside. I put it on the back porch until the can got filled up. And then I pulled that bag out and, we, <laughs> and, and then we moved the trash can back inside the house. You might know what I'm talking about. And you young parents or parents expecting, you will know what I'm talking about after a while. But here's something that I want you to understand in taking the trash out. Just a few things this evening um, that if we need we need the ability in taking the trash out to separate clearly what it is we're taking out. It would help us all to take time to inventory the things of our life and identify what we have laying around that needs to go to the trash, what needs to go to the waste, what really that we are holding on to that needs to be discarded as in fact trash. There are things that we hold to in our life that God has died for, bled for, that we could be free, receive, we can live in the newness of life and we're still holding on to some things of the old man. The Bible tells us very clearly what is trash. He said in Galatians 5 and 19, he says, now these are the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations and wrath and strife and sedition and heresies and envyings and murders and drunkenness and revilings and such like of which I tell you before, as I have told you before in the time past, which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He says in first Thessalonians five and 22 and abstain from all appearance of evil. Why? Because we're to get rid of and be different than the world. Now, I'm not going to tell you tonight that any of us will reach a level of perfection that we were without or that we ever not needed Christ as our savior, because we all need him. We will fail God. We'll have mistakes in life. We'll have um, places where we'll need to repent, but we need to separate clearly the trash of our past behind from what in fact is not trash in this life. And you know, if we're not careful, we'll save the wrong things in our life. So we need to figure out what is trash, but we also need to figure out what is not. But he goes on and says in Galatians 5 and 22, he says, for the, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance against such there is no law. And they that have Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions of the lust. We need to understand we have got to separate clearly in our lives what is good from what is not. What is going to strengthen us spiritually and what is a rot, a decay, a smell, an odor. Maybe you've never been there before, but more than once in my life, I've walked into our little pantry or into the closet there to get something to, to eat and I smell a weird odor and I know something is not right in this pantry. It usually smells of sweets, of fragrances, of something else. And when you walk in there, there's something not quite right. And more often than that, every once in a while, there'll be a little, little teeny gnat fly in the air, a little fruit bug. And, and those things are uh, the sign of Satan, but those things anyway, once you get them in your house, you're, you're hard to get rid of them. And you know what we look for? We begin to look for something to rot. The evidence, even if the smell is not there, is the fly was produced off something that egg was laid on something that is now deteriorating and got enough warmth to it that that little fly has grown up off of it. There are signs in our life that we've got to understand and see that there's things that we need to separate clearly from our lives. Not only do we find that there's trash and there's not trash, there's also things that are recyclable, things that we can hold on to, that we should give away, that we should do away and give to other people, not things that are bad, discarded, not things that are wore out, but things literally that we can give to make someone else's life better than what it was, make an impact in their life. You know what is funny to me, that, that when I was growing up, it was nothing to get hand-me-downs, and I thought it was like Christmas in July when some of my cousins would get new clothes, and we got their hand-me-downs because they had better than us, or maybe they were an only child, and I'm the oldest of five, so guess what? I got it. I was tickled to death. I remember the first time I got a pair of Nikes. They was old and used and I thought I was something to have a pair of Nikes. Some of you under the sound of my voice don't know what it is to walk around without a cell phone, but I'm going to tell you, I was not in my, I was through or almost through college when I had a cell phone for the first time. I was out of college and married before I ever got texting. Some of you wouldn't even know how to function without texting today. There's some recyclable things in our life that we 
need to discard, not that they're bad, but that someone else can get the use out of them and be glorified better and strengthen and encourage them. I made the statement this morning, I was praying about it before I come out here. I made the statement incidentally this morning, how that this body of believers is a community within itself. And my dear friend, I made a statement, no doubt under the inspiration of God, because it is more true in my mind now than it has ever have been. If we know somebody in our church that is hurting and we can help them, especially with something that we're not using, my Atlanta, we should do our very best to uplift them and encourage them. And maybe it's not stuff. Maybe it's just stopping by their way and saying, by the way, thank you for being faithful to our church. Thank you for opening the door. Thank you for the food you brought. Thank you for the card. Thank you for just showing up and doing what you could in a time of need. Because let's be honest, this church does not operate and function to this one pastor here. There's people that turn the lights on, turn the heat on. There's people that, that the other day the septic clogged up on a rainy afternoon Sunday after a funeral. And then you've got men out there of this church who went out and cleaned it, then waited on a pump truck to come and clean out the septic and go on. Thank God for them. Thank you, every one of you who done that because they took their time and effort. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of moving pieces to our church. And as it grows, it will continue to do that. Do not discard and don't throw aside things that could be used for glory and for honor and for strength and for encouragement because we are living in a day. Brother Wade said it uh, just a little bit ago, Matthew 24. He says that there shall be many false prophets that shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many should wax cold. But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. We are living in a day where people are becoming so iniquity bound, which iniquity means lawlessness. There's so a lack of lawlessness that people are afraid to love. They're afraid to care. They're afraid to help. There, there are, there are uh, industries and there are businesses in our country right now that if they find out, maybe salesmen or maybe service techs, if they find out that their service tech pulled over on the side of the road and helped somebody out, they will fire them because at some point in their corporation, someone pulled over on the side of the road and got hit over the head for trying to help somebody. So now their company policy is that they can't pull over anymore. They can't help people anymore. And we think that society, well, you know, I talked to Sister Julie earlier today. She said, I remember we drove to Texas to Nationals and we broke down all these church buses passing us by and there we broke down 100 degrees outside and no one's helping us. Can I tell you, it don't take much to make an impact in this world. Be kind, be nice, talk so softly, genuinely care about people and it will make all the difference in our life today. Now, and when I was growing up in before, even to this day, I, I try to tease my dad, but my dad is just who he is and that's fine. I love it. He loves to take scraps to animals. Now I grew up doing this, but I love the pigs. I don't like cats and I'm not a big fan of dogs. I'm not, but I love a pig and I like chickens and I don't know why, but I do. And so I'd go out there. We had a slop bucket or a scrap bucket. I guess if you want to be a little more proper about it, and we'd put all the everything for the day went in there. And every single day when I went to feed the hogs, I went out there with that little ice cream bucket filled up or a five gallon bucket, depending on what time of the year it was. If it was close to harvest, if it was in the garden season, it'd be a five gallon bucket. There's always more scraps. And we'd go out there and then you'd get up there to the gate. Every once in a while, I'd take that bucket and pound it against the gate. I wouldn't have to say a word. And here they'd come oinking and, and uh, they kind of got a bark to them. If you've ever been around hogs, and here they come jumping inside there and you dump it down in there. Oh, I'm telling you, if you wanted to be their best friend, you took something good to them. It meant nothing to me, but it made all the impact to you. Now you hang on for just a second. This world can say whatever they want about Jesus Christ. They can say whatever they want about us. But I'm telling you, just like an old pig, when I hear someone talking about the goodness of the Lord, boys, I can't help but want to shout and rejoice because I was the beggar. I think that woman that came from outside of the city came to to Jesus and said, could you heal my daughter? Could you do something great for her? And he says, honey, I would, but this is meant for the children and I can't give this to the dogs. She says, yay, Lord, but even the dogs lick the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Boys, I'm telling you, I'm just a beggar and a dog today in the sight of God, but thank God he let some scraps fall from the table tonight. I'm telling you, as we see you in taking out the trash, you need somebody and in your life, you need to separate clearly what is important from
from us from what is not. I mean, some the world would tell us that riches are important. The world would tell us that financial wealth is gain. But I'm telling you, today this prosperity crowd, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 and 3, he said, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, and dotting about questions and strife of words, wherefore cometh envying strife, railings, evil summerings, he says, perverse um, disputings of men of corrupt mind, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness or of godliness. He says, from such withdraw thyself. There is a time in our life that there may be trashy people, for lack of better words, who are influencing you. You need to shut the television off. You need to disconnect yourself, unsubscribe from them newsletters. If they are not of God and they do not align with the word of God, dear friend, he said, from such withdraw yourself, get away from it and quit letting that type of filth or trash infiltrate our lives. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, I think it was Peter that came to Christ. And when Peter came to him, he said, you know what, Lord, in chapter 18, yes, Matthew. And he came to him and he says, how many times should I ought to I forgive my brother? Seven times. He asked him seven times would be courteous for someone to do you wrong before you got uh, even with them or told them to go away. And Jesus response to him was, how about seven times 70? How about we take this to a, a different um, place that we begin to understand? He's saying, I don't want you just to just to be able to look at an issue and divide it. I want you don't just to keep track or record. I want you to love so dearly. I want you to have such a spiritual clarity to yourself and what you do that you don't need to keep track of it. There's no amount of forgiveness that you can ever limit and ever do wrong. And God help us that we ever get so immature in our Christian walk, even with years of service under our belt, that we cannot separate the solid truth from our shifting emotions that come day and night in our lives. What happens in anyone's life when we surrender ourselves to prayer and to the reading of God's word, we will not help. We cannot help but to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when it comes to taking out the trash, you need to be able to separate clearly what is trash from what is not. You got to understand it. You got to know it. Here's how. This is it, boys. This is it. This is the rule of thumb. This is all we need. This is, a, this is the, the master plate, the template you need to study. And then when something else comes awry or something else doesn't seem right, it will automatically chime off. It will automatically pop up. Your spiritual antenna, something inside of your soul will say, I don't know where that's in the Bible, but that doesn't sound right. I don't know. And you know what we would find? Such a clarity in our churches when we come to a place once again where we can separate clearly. I cannot tell you the instances growing up as a child where my mom or my dad would walk through and say, get that out of here. That's trash. <laughs> my dad got on me one time. I was a young teenager and watching MTV and it was a trashy show that I shouldn't have been watching. And he come through and he says, surely there's something better on than this trash. <laughs> and I started laughing. I got in trouble later that day. And the, but I tell you this, the channel changed in a hurry. Hey man, I knew what he was talking about. It was the last warning before things got bad. So that channel changed as fast as I could. He, I, at that, oh man, Man, it's going to get good tonight. You might shout. You might pout. At that time, I wasn't mature enough to clarify what I should and shouldn't have been watching. But he, as a good father, was. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, sometimes our spiritual clarity should be able to help those who are under us, our children, our offspring, and God help us, those that are around us, especially when that is needed in a form of love. I'm telling you, I'm not your police officer, and I ain't worried about what you do and what you don't do. You need to be responsible to the Lord. I'm just an under shepherd. You're not going to give an answer to me one day after a while. I'm going to pillow my head and I'm going to go and lay my head down in a grave one day after a while. God's going to usher me home and he'll never ask what you did or didn't do. He'll ask what I did and what I didn't do. But dear friends, it will have nothing to do with the response of what you have done on my account. Now listen, if that being said, I will be held responsible for 
separating clearly the word of God and for preaching the word of God. And as this is a message tonight on taking out the trash, not only do you need to separate it clearly, you ought to recycle if you can. I love recycling. I think it's a good thing. But in separating all those things, after they've been separated and you've identified this is trash, this needs to go, you need to put it in a sealed container. Amen. Put it inside of something, wrap it up, put it in a bag. I don't care what kind of bag it is, but wrap it up good. The, I, the, 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 and then once you get it in your little bag, you put it in a container and you put the lid on it and you lock that lid and you shut it. And there it is. It is safe in that sealed container. The sealed container being the key, the, the key word, by the way, putting it inside of there, just identifying trash doesn't help any of us. I see a lot of people who probably sit on their front porch and look at the trash in their yard, but they don't do nothing about it. It don't help us until it's in a sealed container. Amen. A trash with a lid is great. You know that a mouse can squeeze through the size of a hole of like a dime, they say, and a rat, a full-size rat, can squeeze through a hole of a quarter. That, that, that's crazy, and that's creepy at the same time. That's amazing to me. They can manipulate their little bones and squeeze down through a little teeny hole to get something on the other side, but I want you to understand, it is easy and just as easy for people, Christians and non-Christians, to squeeze into other people's trash when we don't need to be and dig around in it, especially when it's not in a sealed container. Amen. Thank you for the smiles. I'll take them tonight. The reality is, a lot of people's business doesn't, it doesn't involve us and isn't important. And when Paul is telling them here that we need to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. He's telling us both ways. There's some people that don't like drama in their life, but they want to know everybody else's drama. Hey man, I'm telling you, you better put a sealed container on it. You better be careful what you confess, who you confess it to. But the Bible said in first Peter two and one, he says, wherefore laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envyings and evil speakings as newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. And if so, that you be, that you have tasted of the Lord, his gracious. I'm going to tell you, I hate more than anything. People prying me for information and worse off than that. I hate when other pastors pry me for information. Amen. And pastors call and ask me questions about people I've not seen in a decade. Wondering what's going on up there. And I say, well, you're such great friends. Hang up the phone and call them and ask them. Why are you calling me 400 miles away in a different state to someone I haven't talked to? Go call for yourself if you really need to know. Their business is their business. It ain't my problem and it ain't my puddle. Amen. Listen, and it's the same way in our families. Our families, thank God that our, our messes and we all have them are in a sealed container should be and place them in there and my goodness, leave them in there. Now I'm going to take it a step further tonight. When you put things in a sealed container, it's because you don't want things to get in there. Now growing up in the country, you and I both know and where we live rolly right now, you're going to deal with more than just a regular house cat every once in a while. You might have a stray dog, but where we live, you're probably going to have raccoons, possums, a skunk, a mink, maybe even a bear. And there's going to be some precautions you're going to have to take to keep the lid on that trash. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I hope you're enjoying it tonight. The reality is we put things in there because we don't want them to come back out. We want them bagged up, trashed up. We want them put in there and sealed up. And before too long, my, my buddy of mine, I had hogs and chickens and ducks. And my other buddy, he had horses and donkeys and mules and all that stuff. And that was cool. That was great. And then I noticed when I went to his house, his feed was all in the feed room. And inside the outside of the feed room where the horse was or where the donkeys were, because he had different barns, he had a metal trash can. That metal trash can be full of grain. And on top of that metal trash can was a center block. Because at some point or another, a raccoon decided or found out there's feed inside of there and it's easier to get in that bin than it was to go out and get something. It was easier and more delightful and, and maybe tastes better to get that sweet feed, that molasses covered grain for the horses than it was to go out and uh, find his own food. So after a while, putting the lid on it wasn't good enough. He had to put a giant rock on it or a cinder block on it to put some weight on it to seal it up. He wanted to make sure because that raccoon knew it was in there. 
Don't you know Satan knows your messes? Don't you know he knows your, your pitfalls and your failures? And don't you know he wants to broadcast it to the whole world? There ain't nothing worse as a young boy growing up when it was my job to take the trash down, to take the trash down to the end of the road, pile it up for the trash man and forget to put the lid on something. And I'd be standing down there getting ready for the bus. There'd be trash one into the other. And I knew, hey, listen, my house is different than most houses today. I knew I had to pick up that trash before the bus come or mom would get me out of school and bring me home and she'd take the trash out, right? And I was going to pick it up whether I got off the school bus or whether I did it before the morning. Now, listen, I don't want and you don't want no one in our trash. So put it in there and seal it up. Can I tell you today, we live in such a society that there's a mess everywhere all the time. And then we stand on a platform like social media and say, here's my mess. Take a look at it. Don't it look good today, boys? Here's the problem. Dear friend, you don't need to broadcast your mess, your problems, your trouble, your children's trouble, your marriage trouble, your society's trouble. It ain't fixing nothing. We're just sharing confetti and littering up the world. Can I tell you, dear friend, if you want to share a picture, amen. I'm going to like it, love it. I'm going to applaud for it. If you're going to share a picture of how much you love your husband and happy anniversary and God bless my children, amen. I'm all for it. But boys, I'm going to tell you, keep your trash off of Facebook. Keep it off of social media. Is that good enough? Amen. Someone use it for good. Praise the Lord. Thank God for your blessings. I'm all about it. There's not an envious bone in my body. But listen, don't tell the world how hard life is and tell God how much you love him. Don't tell the world how bad Satan's been to you and how you've been mistreated. Boys, he is our Savior and our Redeemer. If we get nothing else out of this life, we have a home in heaven and thank God we have something to look forward to over there. Put your stuff in a sealed container. You know, I've realized this and I wasn't real smart about it, but at some point in my life, being a supervisor for a maintenance system, we had an ongoing pest uh, control maintenance plan or whatever you want to call it. I can't remember what we, the acronym we had for it, but it was an ongoing thing. Not that there was a problem, but you had an ongoing thing. So there never was a problem. And so I asked the Orkin guy would come in a, a once a month or something like that to different facilities that we had. And I'd say, we've got these wolf spiders. The ladies are scared to death of these little wolf spiders. You need to get them. I don't care what it costs, but I'm sick of hearing these secretaries scream and I'm sick of the emails. I, I want you to get rid of the wolf spiders. He says, I can't. What do you mean? He says, if they're in the hallway and I see them, I'll shoot them, they'll die. He said, but you can't bait a spider. He says, there's nothing out there now, I don't know how true this is. This is what he told me. He said, there's nothing out there that I can put it down that's going to come eat. He said, the only thing you can do for a spider is to kill its prey. That's it. You want to get rid of spiders in your house, you get rid of the little bugs in your house, spiders quit coming. There's your secret for the day. If you get rid of their food source, they'll quit coming around. And I told him, I said, get rid of the food source. Put down what you have to. And we finally found out they was eating these little paver ants and they get them these things and all those things. So we started spraying for bugs so many feet out from the buildings, inside the buildings, in the hallways. We'd go through on a break when all the children were out, when all the staff was out and do a super spray. And before too long, the spiders had disappeared because there was nothing for them to eat. Preacher, what are you saying? I think it was the apostle Paul who cried out or, or yeah, it was Paul and Linda Chack of Act chapter 20 that Paul says I he said take heed therefore yourselves unto the flock he says to which you have made your overseers of and of and he says and to feed the church of God that he has purchased with his own blood knowing this that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in not sparing the flock here's what he says in verse 30 of Acts chapter 20 and also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away themselves disciples you know what he was saying at that time he He's saying literally, there's going to be people that rise up in the congregation, try to take the helm as soon as I leave because they're going to want that authority. They're going to want to draw people away. You amaze me, and sometimes not you, but everyone amazes me, including myself, how we stand there at such all and we forget that in not taking out the trash and not sealing it in a container, we are leaving things open for the public to which has no business into our business of our lives. I've seen a social media 
media experiment the other day where this man was actually stalking a man and woman. He meets them outside of their um, restaurant that they were eating and he says, by the way, he said, it's me, your long lost childhood friend. And, and this goes on for 10 minutes. He says, I haven't seen you in a long time and, and uh, um, it's good to see you. And they're kind of uh, standing away by the side thing. And I don't really know this guy. And um, they're trying to remember. You can see him pondering. He knows everything about him. He knows what kind of car they drive. He knows their favorite restaurants and, and, and he knows about their families and their in-laws and all these people. And he just keeps going on and on. It goes on for 10 minutes. And finally he tells him, he said, sir, he says, I hope that you're not upset, but this is a social experiment. We just want to let you know all that data. I just told you for 10 minutes, I pulled from your social media account. We've stalked you for um, less than 24 hours. We know everything about you. When you go on vacation, what you eat, when you eat it, where you work out, what you do, all these things. And you better understand something tonight. Our children are susceptible to things that we never were because we're putting things out there that we never put out there before. The world knows when our kids got their tonsils out. <laughs> Didn't have my hanky or I'd wave it. <laughs> the world knows everything about us. If they're going to know something about us, I hope they know that you love Jesus. I hope they know that you're born again, that you've surrendered it all to God and you're living in the newness of life. Dear friend, when we're taking out the trash, we simply need to uh, have an identification. We need to understand to separate clearly what's trash from what's not. We need to place it in a sealed container. And dear friend, we need a strong collector. Amen. Here's the last point, a strong collector. I think that one of the, uh, one of the greatest guys you'll ever know is the guy that stops by your house you've never waved to you never say hi to. He probably don't get a Christmas card or Christmas present or Christmas candy, but he comes every Tuesday faithfully. He picks up the worst smelling garbage. He picks up everything we don't want. He puts it inside his little blue truck, squishes it down, and then he takes it off the road and goes to the next house. And he does it every single day, day in and day out, week in and week out. My goodness, if you're a trash man tonight, we love you and we thank God for you. Amen. We need a strong collector, someone who's going to pick up the garbage of life and haul it off. No wonder, no wonder Leviticus chapter 11 or chapter 17 and verse 11, the, uh, the, the writer says for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it unto you to make an atonement upon the altar for your souls for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And the atonement literally means kephar. It, it is a Hebrew word. It means to cover. And when it's simply used in the term of forgiveness or or to be forgiven or to remove. It could be used as kephar to cover, Nassau to lift away, or salaj to, to, to send away. Literally, the forgiveness of God, when it shows up in our life, it covers up, it lifts up, and then it takes away or carries away our sin, our pain, our mess, our garbage of our life. When Jesus Christ and the blood that comes from Calvary shed down upon our lives, it listen to me, it covered our sin. It lifted our sins and then it carried away our sins. When he went to the cross of Calvary, he lifted the sins up off of you and I so we could go and go in the newness of life. Six months ago or so, I was teasing my mom. She had done remodeled her home and I mean, she had ripped out her kitchen and all this stuff and piled it up at the end of the road and the, the trash guy stopped and looked at it and he got back in his thing and kept on driving. He wouldn't get none of it. And so my mom called him and she said, hey, you got to send the trash trash guy back here. We can't wait and we've got too much trash. And my mom, I'm telling you, if she was swinging, she'd hit home runs every time. I don't know how she does. She's blessed and has favor with the Lord. And I know she'll watch this later. So maybe she'll hear me bragging on her a little bit. I'll get some brownie points. And so, and this goes on and you can ask her the next time you see her and see if I ain't telling the truth. They call, she calls and says, and they, they call the guy and he says, got too much stuff, can't haul it off. And she said, he didn't get none of it. And I don't have any limit on my trash service. There is no limit on my trash service. The lady on the other end of the phone says, well, man, I, I see that's noted on your account. You're right. We're going to send him right back. And I told my mom, I said, how in the world did you get them to put no limit on your trash service? Everybody gets three bags <laughs> and one can. How did you do that? She says, I don't know, but it's on my account and I'm keeping it. Listen to me for a minute. 
You don't have enough trash in your life that the Lord won't carry away. You don't have enough pain in your life that he can't lift it up, carry it off, and take it away. You don't have enough disability and dismemberment and pain and suffering that he can't wrap his arms around you and the love of Jesus Christ carry you away to a new place. You don't have enough, but I'm telling you this, no wonder the, in Romans, Paul would say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, not because you are perfect. He said, but that you be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God concerning your life. Why? Because you have the ability to call upon God and simply to ask for a strong collector to stop by and he will carry away everything you don't want. You've got pain in your life. You can ask him to carry it away. You've got sufferings in your past. He can carry those away. You've got heartaches of bygone you can't get over. He can carry those away way to. Hey man, you've got a past you can't forgive yourself about. He'll carry that away. You've got a falling out with a family member. He can carry that away. You've got a falling out with a church member. He can carry that away and make you love each other again and put you back in the fold where you should be. I'm telling you, we have a strong collector tonight who takes all of our trash. Can I guard you this, this? It won't cost you a single red cent. But you know what the Bible says in Proverbs 18 and 20? A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase, increase of his lips they shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. It is vital, it is vital what you say and what comes out of your mouth. You ought to be cautious. I'm cautious of who talks to me around my children, of the topics they talk about. I'm cautious of the topics I talk about to my children and anymore I'm cautious on the topics I talk about about to me. Amen. Because some things will get me messed up. Some things will get me angry. Some things will get me mad. I thought my poor deacon standing out there at the end of the road today, or this morning, early this morning when I pulled in the parking lot, he was standing there and uh, I, I didn't know what he was looking for, what he was waiting on. And I pulled in the parking lot just waving my hand and smiling and ready to shout and looking for the glory of God to split the eastern sky. And he just stood there and he looked over at me. Little did I know that his truck got borrowed for a few hours without his consent. But I'm going to tell you something. He was having a bad day and I didn't realize it. Can I tell you, it's a good thing your pastor didn't show up when all those things were going on I, because I would have done things that I probably would have regretted. Now you listen to me for a second. You've got to understand that we are not in control of things, but he is in control of everything. He is the one who is orchestrating these things. He's the one that will guide us and protect us and be there for us when we go on. It is important and it is vital that you watch what you say around your children. And I don't care if they're 30 years old. It is vital that you watch what you say around young Christians. I don't care if they're 60 years old. It is vital that we protect each other's character and conduct and that we love one another. It is vital that you speak cleanly and clearly around lost people and nothing but good comes off of your lips and your tongues and if you don't have nothing good to say honey don't say nothing at all hey man now listen I read a story some time ago about some birds now you may not realize this but they've got all kinds of documentaries and shows on waste management and all these things and the trash we've got they've got these birds that show up uh, right outside Columbus Ohio on the south end when you're coming up 71 on the right hand side of Columbus Ohio there's these massive ball fields I mean field after field after field some of you have played on them. And on the left side, right at the Grove City exit somewhere in there, there's a giant mountain there. The only thing is there ain't no mountains in Columbus. And let me enlighten you what that is. It's a heap of trash underneath the dirt. <laughs> you may not have known that. You'll see all kinds of birds flying around there in the sky. It don't matter what season it is. It don't matter if it's raining or shining. And they've got birds who have made that their home. They landed in there because there was cheap food there. They landed there because there was a little bit of something they could snack on. Now they've got all these birds who have built nests there, had babies, died, and then the babies grew up and they died and they had babies and now they got generations of birds who have never left that mountain of trash. They don't know what it is to live in the environment. They don't know what it is to live in nature. They don't even know how to fly south for the summer or for the winter because they know is to stay right there at that pile of trash. Now, if we're not careful, it's getting good now, boys. We'll just pop it in a pile of trash. We'll feed it to ourselves 
this. We'll feed it to our children. And then our children will go up thinking this is what church is. We just talk bad about people and we sit around and pout our arms. But I'm telling you tonight, boys, there's something greater than that. It's not at the heap of trash. It's right next to the foot of the cross where we find that blood ran down for you and I. And we could come in here and rejoice knowing that we've been born again and saved and on our way to heaven. Now, I've never seen it before, and I didn't realize this. I've heard stories of it. But New York City's got quite the trash problem. And I didn't realize this until I got to study. And then, of course, I stumble on all kinds of things all the time, looking for information and find out things. But New York City's got trash strikes all the time. Well, it don't matter if you're out in the country. You might be able to hold back your trash a little while. I don't know. We never had a trash strike around here. I never had one in the time I was growing up. But New York City now, they've had trash strikes several times. 1911, they had a trash strike. 1968, 69, they had a trash strike. 1981, they had a trash strike. The 1981 trash strike in New York City lasted 17 days. For 17 days, millions of people poured their trash out onto the sidewalks and onto the street, and it couldn't go anywhere. Why is it vital that we have a strong collector? Because he's never went on break on me. He's never been on strike. He's never said, I'm sick and tired of you, Hatfield. I ain't answering your prayer. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of you. I ain't coming to your rescue this time. I'm sick and tired of you. I ain't going to the hospital with you. I ain't going to be with you at the funeral this time. You're on your own, big boy. I'm not going to help you preach tonight. I'm not going to be there for you. Every time I've called upon his name, boys, he showed up in my time of need. I don't know about you, but he's never went on strike for me. You want to know why? I stand back and think, man, what a strong collector. Not only that he could take care of me, but that he could take care of all you as well. Not only our needs, but the needs of the world today should they request him. The Bible said in Psalms 103 and verse 12, he said, as far as the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgression from us. I'm telling you, I don't care if you got super hefty stretch bags tonight. I don't care if you wrap it around a metal cage and you carry your trash to the end of the road and lock it up. But if there's no one that stops by and collects your waste and takes it to a place, place where you don't know that you'll never see it again. See, when the trash man comes by and he picks up my trash, I, once it gets in that blue can and once it starts rolling down the wheels, I never worry about it coming back. Hey man, I've worried about the trash guy making it up the mountain. I've worried about snow roads blocking him. I've worried about holidays hindering him. Hey man, I seen the trash truck break down on 119 the other day. I worried about him coming, but thank God once it gets in there and leaves, I I don't care anymore. Boys, I'm telling you, when Jesus stops by, you say, what did he do with your sin? He cast him into a sea of forgetfulness. I don't care where they went, but I know they're not in my home anymore. Thank God he can take the trash away. I think it was Paul, let me come to a close, who said in Philippians 3 and 7, he says, but what things we have to gain. To me, he said, those things counted lost for Christ." He says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I do count them as dung that I may win Christ. Paul's telling him as our singers are coming tonight, the piano player comes or whoever's playing for us tonight. Paul's telling him everything I've ever placed out there, everything the world said I've lost, everything the world said I was crazy for giving up, everything the world says, man, you're going to regret that. He said, everything I give up for the Lord, I just counted it as trash. And I tell you something tonight, if there's something hindering you from going a step further with the Lord, if there's something hindering you from doing what you're supposed to be doing in the Lord and you're willing to give that up and set that aside, dear friend, I'm telling you, and take that trash out of your life, you will look back at this point in your life and wonder why in the world you held on to it for so long. See, it's easy for us as we stand across the building while they're getting ready. It's easy for you and I. It's certainly easy for your pastor. When my little baby... When we change her diaper and I take that diaper and throw it in the can, it's real easy for me to identify that as trash. Amen? It's got a distinct odor. It's got a distinct smell that I don't want that thing in my house. But you know what? There's a lot of things like that in our spiritual life. And to the Lord, he's sitting there scratching our head saying, don't they want to get rid of that smell? 
Don't they want to get rid of that trash? Don't they want to move on to something better? Don't they want something better? Why in the world would they hang on to that smell? But sometimes we stay around it for so long, we get used to it. I want you, as we started this service out, I asked you, I want you to take inventory of the things in your life. And maybe, maybe there's something you've identified in the time that I've been preaching that God has moved on your heart. No doubt the Holy Spirit has spoke to you because the ultimate goal is that we cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of our flesh and our spirit. If there's something hindering you tonight, you're lost and need to be saved, we want you to come tonight while they play and sing. Page 165. It's time that we take the trash out of our life. We do exactly what God wants us to do.